Grab your Bibles or your devices. I'm going to ask you to flip over to or scroll down to Matthew. Starting at the very beginning of the New Testament this morning, Matthew chapter number 28. You probably already know that because <clears throat> the best songs that we sing in church are word-based. <laughs> and so you should have already been sneaking over to Matthew 28 while Minister Tamler was ministering that song, Matthew chapter 28. Hopefully you have it. And I'm going to go ahead and begin reading with verses 19 and 20. Just two verses of scripture. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. The musicians behind me are prophesying. Uh, the Lord is working through them. Hallelujah. When David played under the anointing, things changed. Hallelujah. Hmm. How sweet the sound. This, the scripture reads, Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, <laughs> this is the good part. He doesn't just say go. And lo, I am with you always. You don't just have to worry about going alone. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for this day. We are so glad to be amongst the living on this day. We love you, God. We thank you, Lord God, for your word that shall come forth. We ask that you have your way. Have your way in me. I decrease so you can increase. So God, speak to whom you want to speak to on this morning. You know who's listening. You know who's tuning in. You know the needs. You know the desires. You know the requirements. You are the omniscient one. So meet every need, Lord God. Heal broken hearts. Hey, I lift my hands up to you, Lord God. Heal body parts. Regulate blood pressure and diabetes and other infirmities, Lord God, that are afflicting the human body. Thank you, Lord God, for your word that shall accomplish what you sent it out to accomplish. I thank you, Lord God, in advance for the souls that are going to be saved, for those who will be edified by the word, for those who will make the decision to follow your son, Jesus. It is in Jesus' name that we say, thank you, God. Oh, we thank you, God, and we say amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For my note takers in your pad or in your device, we're going to be coming from the topic this morning, the church has left the building. If you don't mind just putting that in your notes or putting it in your status, the church has left the building because, as Minister Tamla just ministered, Jesus said so. And if you're familiar with the Elvis era back in the 1950s and 60s, at his concerts, one of his announcers would always say, Elvis has left the building. He did this for two reasons. Number one, to steal the crowd and quiet those who were calling for an encore performance, just one more song. And secondly, he would say it later to disperse the crowd who were waiting and lingering at the facility for an opportunity to see Elvis. 
Elvis has left the building. That became a catchphrase, a punchline over time, where people would remove the word Elvis and insert something else. It just signified a dramatic exit. The Pittsburgh Penguins in the Hockey League, their announcer would say at the end of home games, the Penguins have left the building. And if you are familiar with the old, long-running series called Frasier, the main character was played by Kelsey Grammer. And as the theme song was going off, he would come on and say, Frasier has left the building. For those of us who attend Victory Church, that's, not a, uh, that's a familiar phrase because our pastor has been saying for some time, the church, Victory Church, where she is the shepherd, has left the the building. And it was so timely that just two weeks ago at the end of our intercessory prayer call, she came on and said, the church has left the building. So I know in my spirit that God is bringing this word together. My message for you today, saints of God, is the church has left the building. The church must leave the building. The church needs to leave the building. Is there a witness out there? So the commission uh, that we hear about all the time is recorded in our text, Matthew chapter 28, and that is commonly referred to as the Great Commission. But it was preceded, if you uh, are familiar with that uh, same book of the Bible, in Matthew chapter 10 called the Limited Commission. And in the Limited Commission, Jesus restricted his disciples to only minister uh, in the local area of Jerusalem. They were restricted to only minister to, to fellow Jews. Jesus referred to them as those who, who were in, he called them the lost sheep in the house of Israel. That was the limited commission, but listen, the limits are gone. There are no more boundaries. We now have the Matthew 28 Great Commission, and though it was initially given to the disciples, uh, it is applicable and it's a directive to you and I on today. All Christians have to go. And we see this throughout the Synoptic Gospels. After Matthew quoted it, we saw it again in Mark, we saw it in Luke, and we saw it summed up in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1 says, uh, they should not depart from Jerusalem. You're familiar with this. But Jesus said, but they were to wait on the promise of the Father because after that the Holy Ghost has come upon them, they should receive power. And they would be witnesses unto Jesus. He said, both in Jerusalem, he said that first, then Judea, then Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Somebody say, Go. These instructions apply to us today, and I submit unto you this morning that the only way for us to fulfill the great commission levied upon you and I is for the church to leave the building. That's how disciples are made. No matter what the situation, the circumstance, no matter what obstacles are in our way, no matter what opposition, if the church is going to maintain its relevance, if the church is going to remain an impactful and influencer in the earth, we must not be restricted by boundaries. We must not be restricted to any particular location or church building. Are you hearing this? We cannot just preach. We also must reach. And in order to reach, the church must, you type it in there, leave the building. There are a number of reasons why a church uh, would be somewhat confined to the four walls of their location. But I only want to share two thoughts to give us some things to think about when it comes to considering how important it is for the church to leave the building. Just two things. Number one, don't just have church, be the church. Now, I need some people to type that in the, in the notes as well. Uh, don't just have church, don't just go to church, be the church. The Bible never used the word church to describe a building. When the Bible used the word church, you see it in Scripture, it referred to a people. 
a gathering, a community or an assembly of believers like the church at Ephesus. There was not a building in Ephesus or the church at Galatia, the church at Thessalonica. These were the people, not the place. Everybody pretty much knows that. And we also have to remember that Jesus in his time of ministry, he ministered anywhere. Jesus ministered everywhere. Jesus ministered on the side of mountains. He ministered in a boat. Jesus ministered at weddings. Jesus even ministered at funerals. Of course, the funeral came to a screeching halt when Jesus came, but Jesus ministered everywhere. And we see in Scripture that people gave their lives to Jesus. They made commitments to Jesus anywhere. They made it in jails and prisons. People came to know Christ uh, in boats. Uh, in their own homes, people came to know Christ out while they were working in the field. In fact, Jesus was walking along the road. Zacchaeus was so desperate to see who he was, Jesus said, come on down from there and go home. Go home. I'm going to meet you there later, and I got something special for your whole family. I'm about to save your whole family. People came to Jesus anywhere. There was a woman who came to know Jesus while she went to draw water from a well. And we all know Paul, who was temporarily blinded, found himself on the ground in the middle of a road when he met Jesus. These people were ministered by God, but not in a church building. But hear me, and I want you to hear me clearly, because there is nothing wrong with a beautifully adorned and functioning church building. They are practical. They are convenient for fellowship, for training, for worship for equipping, for strategizing. But my word to you is don't become so fixated or overly dependent upon the building because we see right now today that the dependence on a building is not a smart thing to do. I told you the story before that anything that is attached to the earth, when the earth shakes, for example, an earthquake, it shakes as well. But if you happen to be in an airplane in the middle of an earthquake, the airplane is unfazed. It's not attached to anything. The people of God, we are now learning not to be so attached to things because when that thing shakes, we shake. Nothing wrong with the church building. There's a reason why we worship together in church buildings. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says, uh, don't forsake getting together. Don't forsake the assembly together as the manner of some is. But listen, it's not just to go to church. It's not just to have church because over time this can become very dangerous in church circles. Let me tell you what will happen people will begin to come to church just to catch up. They, they want to use the corporate worship experience to make up for their own individual devotional deficit throughout the week. Because they don't pray, they don't praise, don't worship, they don't meditate, they don't listen to Christian music, but then they want to use the corporate gathering as a substitute for the deficit in their own per Listen, I've been reading my Bible all week. While you were listening to the prank calls on the radio station, I was listening to praise and worship music. I've been trying to be in the presence of God as much as I can. There's enough going on in the world today that as many times that I can tap into God, I've been meditating all week. So why do we then have to hold a prolonged service to give you the opportunity to get yours? And then you judge us if it's not on and popping. Oh, the church didn't hit the mark today. But then if we do hit the mark, you are excited. Oh, my Lord, church was good today. I was going in on Sunday. I was going in. Well, God says, great, since you went in, now go out on Monday. If you were going in so much on Sunday, what are you going to do on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday? Come on now. Somebody say, we got to go. I'm familiar with the word. David said it so many times. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. David is the same one that said, one thing that I desire, 
that I will seek after. David was clear, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to be in his temple. We understand that. David is also the one that says that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. These references are all three to a place, but we do understand that David was talking about the presence. It's all about the presence. There's nowhere that you can hide but in him. So listen, you don't have to be uh, in a garage to be a car. You don't have to be in a classroom or in the school to learn. And I think this pandemic has showed a lot of people, you don't have to go to work to get your job done. All of that driving back and forth, gas you've been spending, early mornings, late nights, going to work early, coming home late, you're tired. You mean to tell me I could have been doing this from my... Big, beautifully adorned building, glass, parking spaces for all the supervisors. I mean, the elevators where you can see out while you go up and down. Beautiful places that we go to work every day, and I can do it in my living room. So if you don't have to go to work to get your job done, perhaps you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Oh, don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Perhaps you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. So the church, ladies and gentlemen, cannot be the place that we are confined. We can't be confined to a building. Uh, some people can't assemble. So we don't want to say, well, they can't be in the presence of the Lord because they can't assemble for whatever reason because we can take the assembly to them. The church has to leave the building. Last week, I told you that uh, the devil is after our identity, not our activity. The devil wants to get after who you really are. Let me tell you something. We've been looking at this thing so backwards. Uh, Satan does not care that you go to church. That's activity. Satan is not a bit more concerned that you go to church. He does not want you to come out of the church. Because when you come out of the church, perhaps, you will know who you are. You will know your identity, and you will realize that while you were at church, you are the church. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, we are lively stones built up as a spiritual house. We are the church. The Bible says we are a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We are the church. So Satan is fine if you go to church Sunday morning from 11 to 5 p.m. And you know some people do. Satan is fine if you come back to church after dinner for evening service. Satan is fine if you come back on Wednesday night for Bible study on Thursday night for development training, and on Friday night for joy night. The sir, Satan is fine if your service lasts six consecutive hours because he knows the more time you spend in church, the less time you have available to be out of church being the church. You're not going to be the church in the church. You have to be the church outside. It's time for the church to leave the building. Oh, we got to get this thing right now. Things are changing in the earth. We got to be ready for this thing. I told you last week that oftentimes I would throw out theological theories or holy hypothesis if I might not know something to be for sure. So this is one of those times. Perhaps the tactic that people have been taking is that they hide in church. Because, listen, if you're hiding in church, you avoid the opportunity and the temptation to sin. I'm sin listen, I just can't get my brain around it. It's got to be some other reason that you got to be in church seven days a week. So perhaps if you hide in church, you won't sin because you avoid the opportunity. You avoid the real people. You avoid the propensity. But listen, the Bible says if you hide thy word in your heart, you won't sin against God. 
It didn't say if you hide in church, you won't sin. God, hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against God. God never said hide the Christians in church so they won't sin. If you're going to sin, you're going to sin. And there are people that are messed up today. They've been messed up since their childhood. They were all churched out, Monday through Monday. All churched out. Didn't play any sports, didn't go to the movies. You couldn't try out for the soccer team because the uniform wasn't a long jean dress. You can't kick no soccer ball like that. So you have been in church all of your life, day in, day out. Now you are an adult with an opportunity to make your own decisions and you want nothing to do with it. You don't want to have your wedding in a church. You don't want to do anything that is church related because you feel as if I've done enough church. So if you're spending all of your time inside of the church, you can do the math. It's not enough time left when you're outside of the church to be the church. The real church walks out of the building willingly, knowingly into a world of darkness. The real church leaves the building knowing that you're walking into a world of pain and sickness and viruses and depression and oppression. The real church is aware of the fact that when you walk out of the doors, you are Jesus on display. Jesus didn't hide from problems. Jesus didn't hide from situations. Jesus didn't hide from demons. Jesus didn't hide from darkness. Jesus confronted it. So if we are shining like we are supposed to be, the light of the world, then you can't see a light amongst a bunch of lights. So you in church day and night with other lights and you can't even see light. Because light is more effective in the darkness. Just like doctors are more effective around sick people. Lawyers are more effective around people who need an advocate. So it is Paul in Romans who said it great best. He said in Romans chapter 10, for whosoever, doesn't matter who you are, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What an awesome declaration from Paul. And then he follows it up with a series of questions. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? I got an answer for you. If the church leaves the building. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Answer. If the church leaves the building. Paul keeps asking, how shall they hear without a preacher? Ooh, 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 I know. If the church leaves the building. Paul wasn't done. And how shall they preach except they be sent? Where? When the church leaves the building. That's where you do what you do. So if the church is going to be relevant in addition to having church, And going to church, we must be the church. Somebody give God praise for that. Right there in your space, just say, I am the church. The second way and the thing for us to consider, don't just, hear me, don't just like Christ, be Christ-like. I don't want to trip you up with these words because we're going to hear it a couple of times. It is possible to like Christ and not be Christ-like. You with me? It is also possible to like Christ and not like who or what Christ likes. I don't want to lose anybody. You can be a Christian by definition, say definition, and not be Christ-like by application. There's a revelation of a difference for somebody there. By definition, you are a Christian, but by application, you are not Christ-like. And this creates a big dilemma for us in Christendom. The dilemma is that there's a gap between, hear me, the founder of our faith, which is Jesus, and the religion that bears his name, Christianity. There should not be a gap between the father of our faith and the name. 
But there's a gap because there are some people who are Christians by definition, but they are not Christ-like by application. And it is Gandhi who made the quote that says, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Look it up. Gandhi said, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. So those who like Christ, I call them fans. And those who are Christ-like, I call them followers. And we can't change the world with a bunch of fans. We can't change the world with a bunch of fans and pom-poms and cheerleaders. We got to have followers. We can't turn the world upside down with a bunch of fans. We need followers. So in order to be Christ-like, we have to know what Christ is like and know what he likes. In order for us to be like Christ, which is called Christ-like, We must know what Christ is like and know what Christ likes and who he likes. Paul encouraged us in the word. We talked about this on Resurrection Sunday. He said, listen, it is important for you to mirror the life of Christ. We need to share in the experience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, But most people take that just to mean the death, burial, and resurrection, and it does. The death, burial, and resurrection, we have to identify with Christ through that. But Christ also had a life. And we must mirror the life and take on the life of Christ. We need to take on the mind of Christ. Take on the heart of Christ. And we need to know what Christ likes and who he likes. Like what Christ likes. It's amazing to me how many mean and nasty people that you run into in the church. No judgment here, but the Bible says you shall know them by the fruit that they bear. I'm like, wow, mean and nasty in the church. Now, you probably never heard me make this reference before, but there's the passage in Romans chapter 12. Uh, It's under the auspices of being transformed. Uh, It says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So maybe you are not quite Christ-like because you're in between being Christ-like and liking Christ. You just probably need to be transformed. Is that what it is? Come on, we need to understand how can there be such a gap between liking Christ and being Christ-like? It's not that Jesus just liked certain people, but Jesus was assigned to them. Jesus was called to people, and and the church always uh, admonished Jesus for who he was uh, hanging around and whom homes he went into. Jesus said, the well don't need a physician. And since you got it all together, maybe I didn't come for you. Jesus told a a story uh, in the Bible when he was talking about separating his sheep from the goats. He was doing the separation and he said in Matthew chapter 25 verse 42, he says, for I was hungry and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. He said, I was a stranger. This is Jesus. And you took me not in. I was naked and you clothed me not. I was sick and in person and ye prison and you visited me not. And they said, wait a minute, Jesus. <laughs> when did we ever see you sick? When were you hungry or naked? Or in- when did that happen? And Jesus said, inasmuch as you did not do it for the least of these, you didn't do it unto me. That's who I like. Jesus liked the least of these, and the sooner we figure it out, the better for us. You don't get to pick who Jesus likes. You don't get to pick who Jesus loves. You don't get to pick who God decides to use. God used Rahab, and you know what her profession was. Rahab was a prostitute. God used her to propel the children of Israel in their final stretch en route to the promised land. God used her. 
God used raven. Uh, a raven. He, a raven didn't go to church. The raven wasn't holy. The raven is a bird. God used the raven to feed and sustain the preacher. Jesus tells the story of the Samaritan who showed mercy to a needy man on the side of the road. And then Jesus asked, now, was it the priest or the Levite or the Samaritan who's a good neighbor? Which one is it? So, for whatever reason, we refer to him as the good Samaritan. That's not what it says in the Bible. That's in your commentary. He was just a Samaritan. We call him the good Samaritan because we understand that there was supposed to be nothing good or gracious or merciful coming from a Samaritan. It was an oxymoron. But if we're going to call him the good Samaritan, then we need to call the Levite uh, an ungracious Levite. And we need to call the priest an unmerciful priest. If you're going to call the Samaritan a good Samaritan, you got to describe the priest and the Levites. So sometimes we don't realize in the church that we are keeping the good news, the grace of God, the mercy. We don't realize that we're keeping it to ourselves. The church, ladies and gentlemen, is not an exclusive members only club. And it is our propensity towards self-preservation that creates an us and them attitude. It should not be. The church has got to become more inclusive and less exclusive. The way that the church refers to the world suggests to me that we were never in it, never a part of it, and never, check this, a willing participant. I know I was. I did my part. But if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. But the way that we refer to the world is like it's a distant land full of aliens. That's where your family members are. That, that, that's where your co-workers are. They need you. Don't refer to the world in such a way. And then the way that we judge is just unfathomable. I don't understand. The church will judge people's clothes. We, we judge your appearance. We judge the past. We judge your lifestyle. That's going to make the church look very hypocritical. And let me tell you, in the age and in the day of social media and cameras, you're going to mess around and get told off with all that judgment. Somebody going to say, don't say nothing about the rappers till you say something about them reverends. Don't say nothing about the rappers till you talk about the reverends. We now got social media and cameras. I'm just saying. I tell you, I love the secular artist Fantasia. Ever since her American Idol days, I'm like, wow, because her story was just so compelling. And, and even though I've not made it to any of her concerts, but I will. Newsflash, I will. <laughs> but as I've been seeing on social media, she really has a segment within her concerts that she just pours her heart out to God. Ooh, I know the church don't like that. What you doing sing about us, God? What you doing singing about our God? Down there on your knees crying with that outfit on. The Bible says, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Thousands of people came to see that girl sing. And if she uses one song on the ticket to give God glory, somebody might give their life to Christ. You can't get 10 people to listen to what you got to say. I don't understand why we believe being in the world and around worldly people is because they are contagious, like they got something like a plague. One of my very good friends, we went to college together. When I was stationed in the D.C. area, we went out to a restaurant, just he and I. And the, the lady came out and said, it's very crowded, gentlemen. Uh, we only have a, a place for you to eat in the bar area. I'm like, we'll take it. He's like, no, no. I'm like, why? I'm hungry. Bars don't bother me. It's not a slippery place for me. Bars don't bother me a bit. I'm hungry. 
But there is a belief that we can't go certain places. I want to ask you, how are you going to talk somebody out of suicide if you don't go where suicidal people are? Yeah, there might be some in the church. There may be some in your family. But I would argue that most people who are in that predicament are probably outside of the household of faith. It's just a theory. So how are you going to talk someone out of suicide if you won't go where suicidal people are? They aren't contagious. We are. So when we go out of the church, what we're hoping is what's on us. Oh, what's on us rubs off on them. Somebody put in your, in your status about I'm contagious. I just need about 15 people. Just say, I am contagious. You better stay away from me because what's on me is going to rub off on you. <laughs> We got to leave the building in order to become contagious. Nobody going to catch what you have. <laughs> These are the dangers of not leaving the church. Because when we don't leave the church, you may end up hearing a prayer like this. Father, in the name of Jesus. I wonder if you would stop by the hospital and peek in on the prison and go visit those in the nursing homes. God, go see those on the highways and byways. And God is saying, why are you trying to send Jesus where I told you to go? If I put the spirit in you, why are you trying to extract the spirit from you to send it where I told you to go. How dare you pray a prayer and ask God to go see people in the prison? Somebody put in your status, I'll go. Come on, I mean that on this morning. I'll go. You can't send Jesus where he told you to go. God is omnipresent. Jesus told the disciples, listen, I got to get out of here. But trust me, greater works are you going to be able to do because I'm one person. And I'm trying to go from one place to the other place. And sometimes when I'm on my way here, I get interrupted and called to go see about Jairus' daughter. Or when I'm on the way to this place, I find out that Mary and Martha has called me to come look after their brother Lazarus. I can only go one place at a time. But after I start making more disciples, and you make more disciples, and they make more disciples, and they make more disciples, we can do a lot He said, I need you to go, but I'm going to be with you always. So I got to leave, but you will be endued with power to go do what you have to do. Listen, God put, catch this, the want to in every human, want to. Every human wants God. Now, some people are running behind women, but they want God. You're running behind sex and drugs and alcohol, money and power. But God put an insatiable desire in every human to want him. God puts a want to in every human. Jesus stood and said, come to. You familiar with the passage where Jesus said, come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden and burdened. I got something for you. God put the come to, God put the want to in every believer. Jesus said, "Come to, we are supposed to go to." God put in every human the want to. Jesus stood and said, "Come to, we are supposed to go to." So it is widely accepted, church, widely accepted. We know this story. We just have not put it in application. It's widely accepted that the church was birthed in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. That's widely accepted. But listen, when that service was coming to a close, I wasn't there. But I doubt if Peter stood up and said, the doors of the church are now open. I wasn't there. But the reason I doubt that is because Jesus never told them to open the doors of the church. He told them to go to Jerusalem and wait there. Tarry. 
until you are endued with power. Well, that happened. So when the service came to a close, Peter didn't open the doors to the church for people to come in. I got a news flash for those who continue to say that today. The doors of the church are now open. I submit unto you, the church doors are open so you can get out. The doors were closed and it was keeping you in. Newsflash, doors swing both ways. And if the doors of the church are open, the world says, great, come on out. We've been waiting on you to come out here. We're sick out here. We are lonely out here. We got trouble going on. We need some confidence. We need somebody to pray for us. We are meant to go out into the communities and to take the gospel to the world to reach them. Nothing, nothing should be able to stop us because we are endowed with power. And even though the early church received power of the Holy Spirit, check this now, because I haven't heard this a bunch. They did get the Holy Spirit as God promised. But God told them, after you got the Holy Spirit, you will be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, that starts the out process because Jerusalem means home. Samaria and then everywhere else to the outer part of the earth. But there's nothing in the Bible that shows you that the church did that. They remained content right there in Jerusalem. The Bible says they went from temple to temple and from house to house, but right there in Jerusalem. They never left. And in Acts chapter 8, we see that after Stephen's death, the church was then scared, and they scattered abroad. So the only way that God broke the church up to make them leave, it had to start to become persecuted. Oh, I know I'm right about it. And so they said, wait a minute, the way that they did Stephen, this persecution stuff is serious, and they left the church. That is how God got them to scatter away from Jerusalem. That's what the Bible tells us. So in similar fashion today, we are facing an unseen foe, not necessarily persecuting Christians of the church, but it is indeed forcing us out of our comfort zone. We can't assemble as normal. We don't get to have regular Sunday morning service, Bible study, prayer band, praise service, uh, prayer service, whatever else we like to have. COVID is showing us that our faith does not reside in a building. The early church had to be persecuted for them to get out of the church. Now here we have a foe that is forcing us to think differently and do some things different. We are empowered to deal with this. I feel sorry for ministries or any other organization that was not ready to do what you do. And then here comes the pandemic and the governmental uh, restrictions that are imposed on us. And now you can't do what you were called to do. The technology has always been there. And our God is the one that created the technology for us. Nothing should be holding us back. Kudos to ministries that are continuing to be able to do what you were called to do. The word says go. It does not mean physically with your feet. You got to go. In, uh, in Bible days, the techniques that they used to fish, we have improved significantly on those techniques. But Jesus still said, I'll make you fishers of men. So the techniques that we use to spread the gospel, that shouldn't be the same either. Come on, it's time to go. So listen, I'm through. I want to give you this message. The pandemic is going to lift. I hope you receive that. It's going to lift. When this pandemic lifts, let's corporately ask God for greater wisdom. Let's ask God for greater wisdom on how to share our faith. Let's ask God for greater wisdom on how to be the church. So let me just get you to do this. Don't long for a return to normalcy. Normalcy is already in the past. Let's not return to normalcy because normalcy had us doing it the old way. God said, I'm going to do a new thing in you. 
So when the pandemic lifts, let's, not, let's ask God for not the return to normalcy. Let's ask God for what should we be doing now and God, what is next? How do we, God, come out of this pandemic and do what you've called us to do in light of any restrictions? Because maybe the restrictions will be lifted, but if you return to the same old, same old, you will lose your relevance. Jesus gave us the model. He said, start in Jerusalem. Jerusalem means home. Let me tell you something, men and women of God. If you are watching this service and you are getting connected with God through the singing, through the music, and through the preach word, and you are allowing your children to watch TV, play Xbox, or Fortnite, or some, some, something else, you are losing a huge opportunity to start at home. Your very, very first ministry is home. And that's what Jesus told the disciples. He said, start at home, and then I need you to spread it. If you can learn to be effective with home ministry, you can go into the office and minister. If you can conquer your kids, you can conquer your colleagues. They may call you all kind of names at home. They do me. But we got to sit around this table and have us some church. Start in Jerusalem. And then go out. So I pray that we evolve from this pandemic. I really do. As a church that's not dependent upon any structure but dependent upon the Holy Spirit that empowers us to go out to a dying world. When the church leaves the building, when the church leaves the building, the Bible says, now I can call your feet beautiful. Because you're taking the gospel out. You're carrying glad tidings of peace you are beautiful because of what you're doing. Otherwise, you are the light amongst light. I want to pray for individuals, and I also want to pray for ministries. This one included, because I pray that we come out of this with a much stronger outreach focus, effort, and apparatus. Not the kind of outreach that hands out cards to invite people to your church. We want to hand out encouragement for people to give their lives to the Lord. And then find a Bible-believing church. And oh, by the way, this is one that you may consider. But we got to make sure that our outreach efforts are not recruitment efforts for your local assembly. Because that continues the mindset of your church. Oh, I promise you there are enough unsaved people all over this land. <laughs> there are enough unsaved people all over this land waiting for the sons of God to be made manifest. And come on out of that church. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I speak a word. I speak a word over individuals who know you and love you. I speak a word over church leaders and ministries, God. We are going to leave the church building. We are going to be able to say the church has left the building. God, you instructed us to go all, all over the world. So we thank you, Lord God, for increased hearts, Lord God, for a dying world. Lord God, we've let it all go. We are done. We are done with the judgment that the world is contagious and we accept the fact that we are contagious. We've got something to spread. We've got something to share. Hallelujah. So God, I pray for the technology to manifest in every ministry, God. Lord God, give them the resources, give them the, the planners, give them, Lord God, the ingenuity to, Lord, develop the technology and use it for your kingdom, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that there will be no hindrance to the spreading of the gospel. Give them wisdom, God. Give them media ministry. Give them media savvy people so that we can know how to get your word to your people. We remove every hindrance and every obstacle out of the way that's keeping the church from leaving the building. 
If you receive that, say amen. Come on, right where you are, just put amen in your status. Hallelujah.